with all of you, and now we are here for this fantastic, I should say, spectacular panel we're about to have right here. So do me a favor, let's welcome to the stage, you know him as many, many voices, and we'll talk about those right now, but please give a nice warm welcome to Josh Keaton. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for being here on this Sunday, closing out the show. It's, uh, it's nice. It's yeah, nice. man. It's been quite the weekend. How have you been enjoying your weekend so far? It is my first time ever in Iowa, and I've been having a great time. What do you yeah. think of Iowa? It's my first time here also. You know what? Like, I'm, I'm from Los Angeles, but I'm not really like a big city kind of person. Um, I, I prefer the quiet, so like I've actually I've really enjoyed this. I've I've loved taking a stroll around downtown. It's so clean and so quiet, and I don't have to dodge traffic. And, yeah, it's uh, really. I, I'm, yeah. I was surprised, but how quiet it is, how clean it is. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's and beautiful. there's a lot of cool things you can do around here. There's a nice restaurants. Yeah, we went and got burgers yesterday. I had burgers and shakes. And did you go to the zombie one? I went to the zombie burger. I I, I did have the zombie burger. I uh, I got the one that had like the the grilled cheese sandwiches as patties. Oh. Oh, that sounds yeah. amazing. No, it was great. It was it was it was exactly as I expected it. It was great. Yeah, yeah, no. It it has they actually have like grilled cheese sandwiches as as the bread. Um, but yeah, it was great. It so was you're great. into like greasy comfort food. Love greasy comfort food. Like like pizza is my number one. Yes. Pizza is my number one just for any, I could have pizza three meals a day yeah. uh, for the rest of my life, uh, which would be an admittedly short life. But um, <laughs> but but a good life. <laughs> but it'd be a great life. Yeah. But then second would be burgers and fries. Burgers yeah. and fries like that's, you know, and the doctor tells me I need to probably not do that so much, but you know. Well, you know, everything you know, in moderation. There, everything in know. moderation. You know. I'm a New Yorker, so pizza's my go-to. There you go. Uh, I there love it, go. love it, love it. But um, yeah. yeah, dude, it's uh, great to sit here with you and get to chop it up with you, of course. I know Me you've too, been man. part of some amazing projects. Again, some spectacular yeah. projects that we can talk about. Um, and we'll get into that really shortly, but I wanted to know just um, how you got your start in acting. Did you start like on screen, commercials, before yes. you moved into yeah. voice? Can we talk about that? Absolutely. Um, basically, I have, uh, I I'm from a family with, uh, I have three sisters. I'm the only boy. Um, at the time, it was just me and my older sister, and she did, like, beauty pageants. So, like, now, those are, like, they're super rigged in the sense that they have, like, like I guess, uh, what would it be, like, microtransactions, if you could call them oh, that? Oh, like that's a good way to say You enter all these little extra events and all that, which right. cost you money to enter each individual one, but the more of those you enter, the better of a chance you have at winning the pageant. Mm. Um, now, she didn't do all of those. She was really strictly in it for the talent competition because she's a singer, and those are a little harder to fake, you know? Like, you can you can give the thing to, to whoever paid for the most uh, little side categories, but it if somebody comes out there and just kind of brings the house down with the song and somebody comes out there and doesn't yeah. and they win, it's kind of like, eh, It's kind know, of hard it's, to hide it's, that it's, from it's hard the to hide audience, it, yeah. Know? So she would win these things and she got uh, a, ta a talent agent through one of these. And so she started going out and auditioning for commercials and I tagged along on an audition for one thing that she was auditioning for. I wasn't even there to audition, I was just there because like my dad worked two, sometimes three jobs and so my mom was schlepping us around everywhere. And um, the casting lady came out of the, the, the casting room uh, to call in the next person. And I just started like chatting her up and talking because I was this precocious little kid. And they ended up bringing me into audition. And I ended up getting this commercial that my, I wasn't even there to audition for. My sister didn't get it. Wow. Um, she still probably hates me to this day for it. But that was kind of like my start in, in the business. And, uh, and then like I kind of did a lot of stuff, but nothing really too crazy. Like, you know, commercials here and there, extra work. I mean, I started out kind of like at the bottom rung of the entertainment industry. Right. Just getting your foot in the door. Just, yeah, get, yeah. yeah, getting your feet wet and, um, and worked my way up through that. And it wasn't even until I was, there weren't that many voiceover roles for kids at the time because usually what they do is they'll hire an adult to play a kid's voice. But there were certain projects where they really, really wanted to have a kid's voice and one of those was Peanuts, the uh, Charlie Brown. So um, they, they always insist on having real kids voice those characters. And so I got uh, a shot to be Linus in uh, Snoopy's reunion, which That's was cool. early 90s, I want to say. Yeah. yeah. And so that was, that was my first 
first voiceover role. I was Linus, which was pretty awesome because I I, I would always watch uh, you know the the Great Pumpkin and oh yeah all the all the all the specials all those, that come around all the on specials. Halloween yeah you know, yeah yeah the, ho- the holiday and specials yeah and yeah I, they were staples of my childhood. So to be able to play that that was that was a, a really really cool thing. And then so there were other roles that came along. You know Peter Pan and the Pirates. Uh, I worked with uh, I'm sure you guys have seen him on the floor. Jason Marsden. Uh, oh yeah. He was uh, among many other things. He was like Max in the Goofy movie and uh, he, he was in. Uh, with, Binks, the, the, the cat, uh, tons of tons of things. But um, he was Peter Pan in this, and we had the Tim Curry as our Captain Hook. Wow. If you guys aren't familiar with the show, it's a great show. Um, and I was one of the Lost Boys, and so we, That's really uh, cool. you know, we did that. And uh, Back to the Future had an animated series, and I was... I watched that growing up. I was, yeah, absolutely. It still holds up. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I was showing it to my kids. We just watched all the entire trilogy, and, and then once it was done, I was like, all right, now we got to watch the animated series because your dad's in it. And um, yeah, yeah, I remember the animated series came out and then they had all like the toys and uh, I remember having like the train. Yeah. And all, yeah. Like I had a lot of the toys growing up as a kid too. So uh, it was such a cool um, cartoon and I'm a huge fan of the movie as well. Yeah. So um, I've always wanted to uh, drive a DeLorean. I've sat in Same. many, yeah. but I want to drive one. Yeah. Well, as a car guy, they're a little disappointing. I hear, yeah, I hear yeah. they're not the best car. They're not fast. They're really not fast like and oh and here's a here's a factoid about back to the future i actually live the the mall by my house is the twin pines mall i I live by the twin pines mall and sadly it's kind of like like a lot of malls it's kind of just empty now yeah it's a ghost town it's a ghost town um yeah yeah it's it's a bummer but like um they have car chargers there so i actually go there and charge my car right where marty mcfly was um running away from from the the terrorists and uh, yeah i would imagine a lot of people drive that same little spot but people probably go there just to take pictures or videos and stuff like that and i guarantee you that that delorean in that space would not have gotten up to 88 miles an hour sadly well apparently you know the delorean doesn't even go up that high they had to like put in a fake speedometer just so it can reach past the 80s. I mean, it was it was the 80s, you know? It, yeah. There was a, still coming out of the gas crunch when everything was like zero to 60 in 12 seconds, maybe. You know, that. Yeah. It's, yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy times. That's really cool. I also saw, and f- uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you were in Newsies, is that true? I was in Newsies. <laughs> Tell yeah. me about that experience. That was, uh, was it like either seventh or eighth grade. And you were a dancer in that film? Yeah, I was a dancer in that film. And that was one of these things where, um, yeah, I mean, it it was like a step above being an extra in the movie where like, I was featured in certain areas and I had to learn choreography, but I mean, we rehearsed for like a year. Mm. No, like six months and then we shot for six months. So it was like a year of time to make that movie. And I did have lines in it that got cut, but I mean, the original cut of the film was over three hours. And Kenny Ortega, the director, his whole vision was to to have a throwback to old movies where they would have an intermission at the movie theater. And that didn't go over well with the executives. They're like, you're not doing that. So they cut like literally two hours out of a three and a half hour film wow. and made it like an hour and a half. Isn't that so, the worst when you do crazy. something and then they cut your part yeah, out? Yeah, I mean, songs got cut out, whole sequences got cut out, um, it, it, like a lot of stuff got, the, more than half of the movie got cut. So um, They need to release the Kenny Ortega cut. They should release the Kenny Ortega I wanna, cut. It I want to see the extended version. But yeah, I mean, that's uh, that was like a year of my life. I was I was out of school. I mean, we had school on the set, obviously, yeah. but I was, I was out of school for like a year filming that movie. Were you a trained dancer at that point? No. Not at all. So you learned everything you learned on set? Kind of. I mean, the thing is, is that my sisters all took dance classes, and I wanted to, like, play baseball. And I was never really an athletic kid, but I would have to tag along with my sisters to all these dance classes because there were more of them, and they all went to dance class. So it's like I was the one that had to just go with the flow. And here's the thing that really sucked. The place that they would take dance classes at was over the hill from our house. And, like... Here's the houses, here's the dance classes, here's the hill. I know I'm painting a very vivid picture. (laughs) But once you got to like the crest of the hill and were starting to come down, there was this beautiful baseball diamond where they had Little League. And it was like it was like Field of Dreams. Like it straight up looked like like Speaking of Iowa, yeah. yeah. It was like it was like out of a movie. It was like Field of Dreams. You you were like coming down this road and you just saw this beautiful baseball field and there were always kids playing Little League on it. And I was I was like the the, the puppy like on the window and every time and this was every day, because they would go to classes every day and I'd have to tag along every day. I so, share similar, so I, I, all my friends played Little League and yeah. I just never got to play but there was the baseball diamond and I'm the little kid looking like, oh, I like, wish I, I could play. Go, oh, I want to go there. I want to do that. But 
But every single day we had to drive over that hill and I had to see the baseball diamond and never got to play. And so I never really got into sports after that. But I mean, now that I look back at it, I wish that I would have taken it a little more seriously, the, the dance class, because I had the opportunity. Right. So this is a lesson for everybody. If you have an opportunity, even if it's not like necessarily the thing that you want, roll with it. It might be amazing because like later on in life, you know, there was Newsies. Um, I was in a boy band in the 90s. I was in a several boy bands. Are you serious? Oh my, I'm not even kidding. We're boy band Yo, survivors, boy bands buddy. for life. Yeah. Do the melt. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously, I lived in Germany for three years, like 2001 That's to amazing. 2004 in a boy band. And then yeah. my another boy band that I came up with, it was a comedy boy band called Five Alive and we were on America's Got Talent a few years guys. ago. I've heard you guys, yeah. Get out of here. Absolutely. I've re I mean, how could you forget the name? The Five on. Alive. Yeah. And how many, how many boy bands had, like, the number? You had and to have the you number. You had to. Well, we actually were going to have a number in ours, but then it was trademarked already, so we couldn't use it. We were going to be forbidden, because it was four of us. That's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, my God. And so, so tell me about changed, your boy band, please. We got changed to No Authority, which I always hated the name, because I'm like, this makes us sound so weak. Because, like, <laughs> the, guy, the guy that came up with it was the other lead singer in the group, and no he was, authority. like, really kind of high on his own farts. And he, he just was really into anything he came up up with. And um, so he came up with this, this name, No Authority. And he was like, he thought that it like made us sound like, like there's no authority over us. I'm like, no, it, it sounds like we, have we no. can't do anything. <laughs> like we have no authority. No permission. Yes, we have none. <laughs> and so I always hated the name, but you know, it was what it was. It wasn't trademarked. So that was, that was kind of like. Did you guys have a big song? Uh, we had a song called Don't Stop that was, uh, that actually got played on the radio and we toured in the States and we, we were in Germany for, uh, um, we toured for about a month in Germany, month and a half in Germany, and about a month in the UK, different parts of Europe. So, I mean, we we uh, we were on Michael Jackson's label. We had our release party at Neverland. That's um, amazing. Yeah, it was crazy. It was what crazy. was his record label at the time? Was MJJ. it uh, MJJ? MJJ. It was distributed That's right. through Sony. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Damn, man, we have like such similar like that bad crazy? stories. That's so cool. It's we're crazy. we're boy band best friends now. We're the Backstory Boys. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that is perfect. <laughs> so, I mean, so you didn't have a background in dancing, but you were in boy bands, and I know boy bands, there's well, a lot the of thing, dancing. Well, I wasn't the strongest dancer in this. And here's another little thing about that, is that I did, because this was not a boy, most boy bands were not friends beforehand. They were all kind of put together by audition. Most of them, I don't know if yours was, but... Um, no, we, we put ourselves together. Oh, you we guys, were, so you we, were one of the few. We rehearsed and practiced in my friend's living room for ages. You guys were one of the few. You guys yeah. were like the, the exception to the rule. But most of them were like auditioned, put together, just you had to become friends because you were now in a band together. You were like cast, yeah. Yeah, you were cast, essentially. So with this, like, I auditioned for it several years before I actually got into it, and I didn't get in the first time. Wow. Because back then, like, I wasn't necessarily much... I mean, I sang, but I wasn't, like, really taking it seriously. And I wasn't really a dancer, because I never took any of that seriously. So I wasn't strong at that. And for boy band, there's a lot more of a focus on dancing. I mean, like, they would rather take a strong dancer and a mediocre singer than a strong singer and a non-dancer. Right. So, um, because it's more about the show. So I didn't get in the first time. And so, you know, time passed. I was in a gospel group for, like, a couple years, and I really kind of um, cut, cut my teeth in, in singing, doing that. And um, I came back and I auditioned again. And this time, even though I still wasn't really that strong of a dancer. My singing was enough to make up for it. And so then I was now the, the lead singer or the second lead or the, the co-lead singer of the group, which is probably why the other guy didn't really like me because mm. like once the other, I, I was replacing somebody else that left. Right. And then so he was like the lead lead singer and that was it. And then now here I come in and now, now you I'm have singing to share, half the you stuff. Have to share the spotlight. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, and we're all teenagers. So it's like, I guess I, I can kind of put myself there and, and understand the ego and all that. But um, yeah, so I mean, I feel like had I taken that stuff seriously when I was a kid, the dancing and stuff, it would have been like cake for me. But, you know, it is what it is. Did your boy band have the classic archetypes? And if so, what was yours? Like, I was, I was always the baby face or the cute one. That I was, was the me. bad boy. The ba oh, and here's the, here's the funny thing. I was the furthest thing from a bad boy. Like, I was a boy scout growing up. <laughs> like, I was so sheltered as a kid. Like, my parents wouldn't let me watch. They wouldn't let me watch PG-13 until I was PG-13. Until I was 13. 13, yeah. Like, what? It was crazy. Like, I missed out on so many cultural touchstones just because I was so like sheltered and held back from certain things so like I was the furthest thing from a bad boy but I was really insecure about my smile in pictures at the time so I never smiled in pictures mm. and because I never smiled in pictures and because I was always 
they were like, he must be the bad boy. <laughs> and, dude, that's, so, and so that's, that's just what I was. Dude, that's amazing. I'm loving that we're having this like boy band moment. It's incredible. Right now. We're going to have to sing something at the end of this panel. I'd love that. All right. What was your like uh, vocal range? Oh, I did. I kind of, well, I, I kind of sang a bunch of stuff. I mean, we, we, I, I did like a lot of falsetto stuff, but I was probably like alto tenor. No, okay. like, like tenor, tenor. Yeah. I'm alto. like soprano. I'm like always singing above the lead. Oh, nice. Like a third above. Nice. That's my wheelhouse. Very cool. But man, this is so cool. All right. So, 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 uh, you transitioned from boy band, from acting, from doing commercials and, and small bit parts in movies and things like that. Yeah. What was the big, the big, uh, voice role that really changed it all for you? I, it was Hercules. It was Hercules because up until Hercules, every voiceover audition that I, that I got sent out on was just, it, it was, I was sent out by my same on-camera agent. So it was just like the same people that would send me out for commercials or that would send me out for like guest par parts in TV shows. Um, they would get a call for a voiceover, they would send it to me and that was that. But once I got Hercules, I, I got sought out by like a dedicated voiceover agent that only represented voiceover clients and only sought out voiceover work. And that kind of opened up a whole different side of the business to me because before like it was just big things like that. But then once you have a voiceover agent, you can get like bit parts in animated series. You can go and audition for like, you know, other even main parts in animated series. Those don't usually or at the time didn't really filter through to T V film agents. And they still don't. They still don't yeah, to, my, for the my most agent part. still I get no voiceover stuff and I'm always asking constantly, Can yeah. you find me some voiceover stuff? And it's usually just like commercials and right. like, well, even commercials didn't come through them. So oh, like, I, I started getting a lot more, uh, well, I started getting auditions for voiceover commercials, radio commercials, TV commercials, um, promos, the stuff that would come in between shows where it's like coming up next on CW or whatever, like that's, that's somebody's voice that has to do it. Trailers, things like that, like things that I never even would have thought of. Um, I now had, I now had the, the opportunity to audition for. And so that just kind of put me more on a track where I was, where I was doing that. Where, where I got busy doing that. I got busy doing a lot of commercials and, and other auditioning for other roles, video games. Like now, now more on-camera people, more on-camera agents are casting or are responding to casting for video games because now we have mocap where you're wearing the suit with the, you know, the balls all over it and you're, they capture your wireframe in 3D and then the, they also capture your facial expressions and they essentially skin this wireframe skeleton with your performance, your, your movement, your facial expressions, your voice, it's like everything. Which is fun to do. It's fun to do. They're but like T-pose and then they, they, they lock you in and then it's like everything you do, the little, ad, the little avatars everything. just dancing around, it's yeah. cool. It's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. And, and the technology's improved a lot since I even started that. I remember the first mocap game that I did was Mad Max, and I nice. played this villain. Uh, he, was, he wasn't really a villain. He was like, he was like the first settlement that you get to in the game, okay. and he was like this this uh, you know this weird guy named Jeet, and um, with that. They didn't have any way of seeing if they captured the scene. Mm. So you would do this mocap, and they wouldn't know if they got it until they took the footage off of the hard drives at the end of the day and fed it into the computer and wow. rendered it. So you might have shot all day, and they get it into the computer, and like one of the things was misaligned, and they, they can't use any of it. You're right, and now so they do it all in real time. Now you can see it. They can see. They can play it back as they get it in. They can they can put what's called previs previsualization, where they'll have like a rough model of the character, or now it's not even. I mean, it's it's a much more detailed model now, where you can see it on a screen. And I don't know who watches The Simpsons here, but there was like a Simpsons episode where they have this thing called an emotion that um, Homer like I, does he invest in it or he? I think he yeah, buys Sure, exactly, it. but yeah, and it's it's that same type of a mocap thing where you can actually watch the thing in real time, follow your movements, and um, it's a fascinating technology because when you shoot something for TV or film, you know they have to have the camera almost choreographed like a dance, where the camera's going to hit certain marks. You're going to have in the editing room where they're going to have like a camera shot where you know they pan in on you or they zoom in on you or they they have the the dolly like tracking this way or whatever, and they they have these predetermined shots and then they they edit those together. Whereas with mocap, they're literally recording the entire space. So they can place the camera wherever they want and have it do whatever they want after, after the fact. So they can film this whole scene and say, you know what? 
we want to we want to start with a two shot here we want to go with an over the shoulder here then we want to cut to a wide shot and then we're going to go to this overhead shot and they can using the same stuff that they've recorded do whatever they want with the camera and see whatever vantage point they want it's crazy it is pretty crazy are you a gamer yourself do you I'm play? a huge gamer yeah so what are you what what are you uh, playing right now well I I go back and forth because I have like two kids and so like for a while I couldn't really play much because they were like little and how old I just are the kids? time they're they're gonna be eight and ten in October okay cool yeah yeah so they're uh, and they're gamers too yeah so I have a uh, four-year-old son his his middle name is link so oh, awesome so yeah I got awesome. away with that one thank you my wife yeah but uh, he's a That's gamer a great name, too though. thank yeah, you yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've had him gaming since he was like two and he's been like killing it and we bowling and all he's yeah. so good but yeah tell me we about play Minecraft so like you know we play a lot of Minecraft like on Fridays, we'll have like family game night where we all kind of go into a survival world and the four of us will just kind of go and, and we'll like do a new seed and then just kind of have different tasks that we have to do and try to make a, our settlement and all that. So we'll, we'll do that. Like right now I'm doing this one thing where we found this ancient city and I'm trying to restore it. So like I'm, I, and we're all in survival. So no, no creative mode. So like I, I killed all of the shriekers and, and all the things that make the warden come out and, yeah. uh, and I'm trying to like get all of the blocks to essentially reconstruct it so it looks like it was before it was like all shulked Demolished. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so cool. It's a huge undertaking. Yeah. And it's very time consuming, but it's, it's, it's going to be cool, you know, so we play that. Um, let's see what else. Um, I've been playing uh, Fallout 76 with, uh, with my wife because we're big Fallout fans. Um, we didn't really originally start playing 76 because when it first came out, it was kind of eh. But um, it's improved a lot, so it's, it's actually kind of fun. I want to check out Baldur's Gate because it just looks like it's been getting a lot of hype and from what I look, from what I saw, it looks like like a really good role-playing game. I personally love RPGs. Um, I love open-world stuff because I like going in and just getting lost yeah. for a while. I was just saying the same thing earlier. Like, I like doing missions and doing tasks, but I like to just run around, yeah. do whatever you want to do, ride a horse down the... You know, just like just get immersed in the world. And honestly, and that's why so Minecraft more was so... It, it, it's it was it's revolutionary. Yeah, like, and and it, you can do anything. It snuck up on me because my kids are the ones who first started playing Minecraft, and they wanted me to play it. And when I first saw it, I was like. What in the Nintendo is this? I'm like, this is like, <laughs> this is like little boxes, and I'm like, how do you? And then I played it, and I was like, it was crazy because after like 20 minutes of looking at it the blockiness goes away and you don't really see it anymore and you just see it as like this world and it's beautiful yeah. and, and the fact that you can you can literally go like pretty much forever. I mean, not technically forever, but forever for us. I mean, yeah. we're, we're never going to get to the end of the world, not without like actually console commanding your way somewhere else. But like if you're just walking around, you're never going to get to the end of it. Yeah. And it's always going to be new and once you've gone there, it persists. That's fascinating. Like, you and can visit all kinds of incredible places. And they're constantly updating yeah. it, so it's never going to get old. It's always going to be fresh. And yeah. it's so cool uh, and fascinating to me to watch my son play because he'll teach me things that I didn't even know about uh, the games that we play. And I'm just and the way they can just manipulate these machines and iPads yeah. and things, it's like so fascinating to Absolutely. watch them. It's so cool. Okay, so you're a gamer. You're a boy bander. Yes. Uh, what other hobbies are you into besides voice acting? I actually am a handyman. Like, I, because I, I grew up, like, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was young. I loved science. I loved taking things apart. I loved tinkering with things. Same. So, like, I, when I was a teenager and, well, late teen, I didn't really start driving until I was, like, 18. But so when I was, like, 18 to, like, my early 20s. So we have, like, the same life. Yeah, dude. I, I tuned cars. <laughs> like, I, I, I modded cars. I still love doing that. I have an electric car now, so there's not as much you can do. But, um, like, I, I still love gas engines. I still love all that kind of stuff. So I, I grew up tuning cars. Um, and then fixing stuff, like now with the house, like I've, I've learned uh, electric, I've learned plumbing, I've learned carpentry, I have like a bunch of tools, and so if something goes wrong with the house, something goes wrong with an appliance, I take it apart and I fix it. It's Figure so out how fun. to do it. I always used to take things apart. It's I so I would always fulfilling. read the instruction booklets before I even like played with a new toy. Yeah. Um, I went to technical school for carpentry, like, like God, we have like the same life. Like honestly, it's crazy I, I've, been, to me. I've been kicking around just like going to electrician school. That would be fun. Because even though I don't need to, 
Like, but it, what a skill to something? know. Yeah. Why not learn something? And it's like, cause I've, I feel like I've reached the end of what I can teach myself with it. And, and like, you have to respect it obviously cause it can kill you. Yes. Um, and, and I'd love to, I'd love to, there, there's so many things about just the electrician trade that I love. Like I love conduit. I love conduit bending. I love seeing beautiful runs of, of perfectly bent conduit. I love looking at a nice main panel with all of, all of the, the breakers landed perfectly nice 90 degree angles. Like I love that stuff. That's, that's so satisfying to me. It's definitely a YouTube rabbit hole you could fall down just yeah. watching people perfectly Absolutely. line up wires. Yeah. It's pretty yeah, cool. I, I watch a lot of these things too. I did all the low voltage in our house. So like all of the, I wired our house for Cat6. Um, I did all the security camera wiring, like all of that. And so, and it's all run through the attic. And when you look at it, it's nicely combed bundles. Everything's perfect. Everything's branched off nicely. I have little, uh, you know, my I terminated everything myself. I did all solid core wires. It's uh, it's nice. It's, it's good really stuff. Really cool. Yeah. All right, well, we can talk about so many things. Everything. Yeah. But. I know the fans are here to speak about your voice roles. Of course, your most famous ones. Let's talk about Spider-Man. We'll talk about Hercules. Yeah, let's do it. And it is a Q&A for the audience. So let's start lining up. Go ahead. It only takes one person to break the ice. Go on up to the microphone. Um, and we'll, we'll get as many questions as we can in the allotted time. And then once we run out, of course, if you don't get a chance to ask your question, we'll get a chance to go and see Josh down at his table. So step on up to the mic. And oh, Josh, just thank you so much for Absolutely, shooting a breeze with me. Man. I appreciate yeah, this it. This was awesome. It we, was. We've talked about so many things that I usually never talk about in panels. So it's this really is cool. Fantastic. All right, so hey, what's your name and what's your question? Um, you can you can bend the mic down. Oh yeah, yeah, you can yeah. move it. Go ahead. Here you go. My name's Delilah. Hi Delilah. Do you want me to say it for you? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, she's shy. Oh, no worries. So she wanted to ask what um, would be your favorite character other than the one that you play in Voltron? Damn it. My favorite character that I've played or just, or my or favorite character the, in character, Voltron? Favorite character in the show, right? In Voltron other than the, the under, one. other than Shiro. Yes. It would be Pidge. Okay. Pidge is my absolute favorite character other than Shiro because she's a badass. Like, she's like this 15-year-old kid who... Like is fearless and goes toe to toe with like Galra generals and even in the comic, there's a comic series that accompanies the show, and she basically, in a very Batman-esque way, makes a list of every weakness that everybody in the crew has in case they go rogue and she has to like take them out. Like she's amazing. Cheat sheet. Yeah, That's cool. she's amazing. Amazing. Pidge is awesome. Yes. Right. Hello. Thanks for your question. Hey, what's your name and what's your question? Hey, I'm Vinny. Good to see you again, Josh. Hey, Vinny. Um, so what is one of your fondest memories playing Peter Parker in the TV show? Oh, man. Um, honestly, just, just going to work every week and getting to see the cast. Um, this is when we still would use paper scripts. So, um, And this is something that I might start doing at cons later. I saved all of my paper scripts from that show, also from Voltron. So I might start like taking some, some of the more memorable scenes and, you know, when I do a panel, maybe having some people come up and, and act out the scene with me. That would be great. Yeah, like yeah, just to table keep it fresh, you know, yeah. do something different. But, um, like, me seeing who was going to be, like, the person who played that that week's villain. Um, I remember Trish Helfer from Battlestar Galactica and many other things was Black Cat. And so I remember, and, and I, I had a, a pretty big crush on her. Oh. And I didn't know that she was going to play Black Cat. <laughs> So I get to the recording session, and I'm parking my, my Mini Cooper with Spider-Man on the roof, and um, I see this, or I hear this black Harley pull up and park right there, and on it is a rider in completely black leather, head to toe, Wow! black helmet. Straight out of the Matrix. Steps <laughs> off, exactly, like, like Trinity. Trinity, like yeah. Trinity. Gets off of the bike, takes off the helmet, like a shampoo commercial, blonde hair just cascading out. It was Trish Helfer. She pulls up to do the Black Cat record on a Harley, leather head to toe. It was it was like a scene out of a movie. Like yeah. I was like, what even is happening right now? It was crazy. It was crazy. It was it was definitely not hard to um, to have that that Spidey Black Cat chemistry after that <laughs> for sure. All right. Well, thank you for your question. Hey, what's your name and what's your question? My name is Nia. Hi, it was, it's Hi Nia. How's it going? Uh, Nia. Oh, Nia. Good to <laughs> um, see you. 
what's a movie that you think Shiro and Curtis would love to enjoy, like cuddling together? And what's the movie that you think that they what would love? What would be their movie? Let me see. Um, that's a that's a tough question. Um, I would say. I would, I would, I would probably say that that it would be something like Xanadu, and Shiro would sit through it just for Curtis's benefit, <laughs> all like side eyeing him the whole time, just like, are we really doing this? <laughs> something, something like that, something fun like that. I love that. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. All right. Hey, what's your name and what's your question? I'm Asa, and uh, I was wondering. Yes. What type of car would Shiro drive? Um, to have to drive one? Uh, let's see. I, I, I could, e I could see him one of two ways. I could either see him in like an old work truck, like a, like a Chevy, like the Chevy box trucks, yeah. um, or, um, or like an electric car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one of the two, that's like, like cool. a, like a Tesla or something like, like a fast car. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so it's either something futuristic or, um, or, or yeah, or, or kind of like a box truck. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for, thank you for the question. That was, that was an interesting question. All right. Hey, step on up. What's your name and what's your question, please? My name is Brody Cole, and hey. I was wondering, how did you get your role in uh, Spyro the Dragon in the Skylander series? That was basically just an audition that came through my voiceover agent. Um, it was a director named Margaret Tang, who I, um, directs a ton of things, who I've worked with a lot before. And um, and yeah, so she, she kind of had me on her list of people that she wanted to call in to read for the role and so I went in and it was a very short script because back then like video games didn't have huge scripts and it was just some phrases here and there excuse me and I went in and just kind of did the audition and and that was it. it it was a pretty simple process there wasn't really anything that that stood out about it or, or anything that was super um super uh memorable about it it, it was just kind of like your run-of-the-mill audition all right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, thank you so much. Hey, what's your name and what's your question? Uh, my name is Risham. Hey, hey Josh. Hey, Risham, how's it going? <laughs> good, good. Um, I do have a question about Spider-Verse, but before I do, um, I, d I don't want to spoil anybody, so okay. is there anybody here that hasn't seen Across the Spider-Verse yet? And do you care if they're... Earmuffs. Earmuffs. If you, uh, if you care, earmuffs. Okay. With that said, three, two, one. And that was your warning. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so w we did talk a little bit about it already, but um, I wanted to... Um, I wanted to rehash it again. Um, just explain, like, how... Like, what you had to do... Um, because uh, your Spider-Man was in Across the Spider-Verse, and if you could explain to us like how your Spider-Man would behave in that movie. Okay, well, I'm going to talk quietly so that the people who are playing oh, their ears don't really have to. Sorry. <laughs> so basically what happens is that um, Peter kind of sides with um, with uh, Miguel over Miles, and I, I personally think that like the Peter that I played would have rebelled and probably would have sided with Miles. However, as an actor... When you have a story that you have to serve, you need to find a way to make it truthful for that character in order for it to be believable. So that's the actor's job to kind of go through and game out what you think is going to have to be, what, what, what events are going to have to happen, what, what um, things would they have to go through to make that um, a viable story. And so the way that I justified it to myself was... You know, Peter was a teenager, very, very impressionable time in his life, already lost his parents, already lost his father figure, Uncle Ben. Um, according to the events of the movie, he loses Captain Stacy, who becomes, who is becoming like a, a, another father figure to him. So that's like, that's like three huge figures in his life gone. And he blames himself for everything. He blames himself for everything. He, he always is, is thinking that it's because of him, and he is always fighting with the fear that that they died for no purpose or or and and to have somebody like just come from the future and tell them hey this isn't your fault this is this is why it happened this is how it happens and this is what needs to happen or else everybody in your universe is going going to die like and this is the only way to save everybody else like putting it with those kind of stakes where he can still save the remaining people in his world I can see somebody his age 
kind of now latching on to this other guy as, as a surrogate father figure after, after having lost everybody else so far and, and kind of reluctantly going with it because he's trying to still give meaning to the sacrifices he's already had to make. That's, that's how I kind of justified it in my head for how it would work. Yeah, I, I know you said it already, but I, I just loved hearing that from you the other day, and I just kind of wanted to share that with everybody else. Awesome. So thank you. I, thank you. I really appreciate it. Earmuffs off. We are back. Hey, hey. Uh, hi, I'm Nathan. Hey, Nathan. As to, um, I, my question, I got two questions. Uh, one is, what was it like when you got the role of Spider-Man? And two, how much has it been a big impact on you as a person? Um... I kind of had a few false starts with Spider-Man, so like where I would get cast and then wasn't anymore. Um, but it, the, the first one wasn't really a bad thing. I was originally cast to play Spider-Man in the 2002, was it? When was the, the Tobey Maguire movie? I think that was in the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah so yeah, like yeah. whenever that one came out, the movie tie-in game. I was originally cast to be Spider-Man in that. And I recorded the whole game. And then they ended up getting clearance to get Tobey to do it. And so, Toby's the voice in that game. But they didn't want to waste all of the audio that they had recorded with me, so they put in a hidden mode of play where if you beat the game, then you got to play through it again with Harry Osborn in the Green Goblin suit. However, it was really just all of the audio that I had recorded as Spider-Man um, with a different skin on it. And they had me come in and like record a few extra lines to kind of make it make sense as if it was Harry. But it was pretty much just a reskin of Spider-Man. So I was excited about that. I was a little bummed when they, they weren't going to use it. But you know what? They were still putting me in the game. It was cool. Like, and and I, I understood because I'm like, you know what? This is a movie tie-in game. They got the movie guy. I can't really be too upset about it. So after that, I was like the de facto Harry for a while. So Spider-Man 2 game comes out, I'm Harry in that. Spider-Man friend or foe comes out, I'm Harry in that. And the guy who played Spidey in that game was James Arnold Taylor, who played Harry in the show where I was Spider-Man. So there was some flip-flopping going around. When it finally came time to audition for um, Spectacular Spider-Man, I was like, I was excited. I was excited, but I had like my eye on the prize because I was like, all right, this is not the movie. I can be Spider-Man in this. You know, they're not going to replace me with Toby, hopefully, because this is this is its own thing. It's not a tie-in for the movie. It's its own thing. So I was really really focused on it because I was like, this is this is my shot. This is my shot. They're not having me read for Harry. They're having me read for Peter. So I, I auditioned for it, and this was back before I had a home studio, so this was like when I actually had to go into my agents and use their studio to audition, and then they send in the audition, and I got a call back. They had me come in, and I read with Greg Weissman, the, um, the showrunner, and the voice director, Jamie Thomason, and basically they, they directed me, they had me try a few different things, um, and it was, they had me read two different sets of sides. Sides are what they call the audition scripts. Um, they had me read the sides as Spider-Man and the sides as Peter so that they can hear kind of what I brought to each, each version of the character, like each, each identity. And um, I didn't hear anything for a long time. And then they had me do a third callback or a second callback, third audition. Um, and I went in and I did that. And then I'll tell you what Greg's story was, because he, he tells this story, and so I'll, I'll tell you guys exactly what he's told me. He said that he had already made his decision that it was going to be me, but it's not just his call. He has the network people, he has the Marvel people, he has other producers, and they all have to kind of come to an agreement. So he said, I was ready to go into this meeting, and I was ready to fight everybody, and I was ready to say, Josh Keaton, Josh Keaton is my Spider-Man. So he's like, so I went into this meeting, and I was like, Josh Keaton, it's going to be him. And then everybody was like, yeah, yeah, I like Josh Keaton too. Yeah, he was the one that I thought was the best one. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, I'm, I'm good with that. And he's like, oh, oh, okay, cool. It was the easiest meeting he said he ever had to have. And so that's pretty much how that meeting went. And then once I got the call that I booked it, I was like, I was super stoked. I was excited. I was like, this is, this is great. Because I already knew from just what I had read in the script that this was, this was going to be a good Spider-Man show. Like, you could feel it from the dialogue. It was, it was great. And... Um, and it's, it's been 
it's spectacular. It's been it's been life changing because that was my that was my hero growing up. Like that was the comic book that I loved to read. That was the um, that that was the superhero that I really really identified with. Um, not because of spider powers, but because of like a double life. Like I was a dork in high school. I was into science. I got bullied. I was short. Like I just was not I was not a cool kid in high school. And for everybody that's in high school, if there's still anybody here in high school, whatever you kind of get pegged as 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 a freshman is the identity you're going to have whether you like it or not through high school from freshman to high school that's who you are and i was always just the nerdy kid and the thing is is that i had a whole other group of friends outside of school that were like my acting friends and i didn't have that judgment or stigma with them so i would go hang out with them and have a great time and feel confident and feel feel good about myself and then I'd go back to school and I'd get dumped on. So it's like I, I constantly had that, I feel great, this sucks. I feel great, this sucks. And and like a lot of spectacular Spider-Man is me just kind of reliving a lot of my high school trauma. Um, but I feel like that's, I feel like a lot of people have that double life and that's probably why he's such a relatable character because we all put on this mask for the people that we have to deal with in our lives when there's other things that we're masking. And I mean, that's, that's, why, that's why we love Spidey. That's why we love Spidey. So it's been, it's been life-changing. I mean, here we are 13 years later and I still have people asking me about the show. I still have people coming up and telling me how much of an effect it had on their childhood. And that's, that's an amazing thing to hear as an actor that you could be part of something that was so impactful on so many people's lives because when we do these projects for the most part we go into the booth we go into wherever we're doing it and we go home you know we leave the work there and then we kind of forget sometimes that the work takes on a life of its own and long after we've forgotten those sessions long after I've forgotten a lot of the stories of what happened in those sessions funny moments or whatever that character is now its own thing and that character is going to continue to reach other people and speak to them and that's just it's mind blowing to me like I, I still have trouble kind of grasping that you know especially uh, Shiro was another big character that I played where he he really he had a lot of a lot of issues that he was hiding and his struggle was much more on the forefront and so many people that still have these struggles identified with him and come to me at cons and tell me how much it affected their life and it's it's just I don't know what to do with it, but at the same time, it's like, it's, 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 it's humbling and it's inspiring to me that it was able to kind of help somebody. Like that's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, All right, well, thank thanks. you so much for your question. Thanks, and also, I want to say I hear your voice whenever I read the comics, too, so I think it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right, we got three questions left. We're going to rapid fire through these lightning round. Here we go. Hi, what's your name and what's your question? Um, hello there. Uh, my name's Jag. Uh, we actually met yesterday, but I... Yes, how's it going? No, it's going all right. It's going all right. Um, I was actually curious, because you also played Ultimate Spider-Man in uh, Shadow Dimensions. Yes. So I was actually curious, how did it feel to be in that game and be you know, part of like three other legendary voice actors who've played Spider-Man over the years. Okay, so for those who don't know, there was a game called Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions and it was kind of like the precursor to um, having all the, the you know, the, the multiverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there were, they cast four different Spider-Man actors from different Spider-Man iterations. They had Neil Patrick Harris, um, who was in the MTV Spider-Man. They had Dan Gilvezan, who was in Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. They had me from Spectacular Spider-Man playing Ultimate. And then they had Chris for Daniel Barnes from the 90s series playing noir. And, and that was the first, I think the first uh, animated type appearance for noir, period. Um, and that was incredible. Like that was, that, I loved the concept. Um, I also liked that I got to be ultimate because he was just a super fun character and he had some stuff with Deadpool, which was awesome. Um, but yeah, it was, I, I really loved the concept for the game and I was, I was really honored that they, that they wanted to have me in it. Um, and what was the, the second part of your question? 
Um, just basically how it felt to be with those three. Oh, how it felt to be with. Well, unfortunately, I didn't get to record with them. Uh, like we weren't in the same room together or anything like that because our, our stories also didn't really overlap enough. Like they were kind of self-contained where they all kind of had a part to play in the main thing, but we didn't have a lot of scenes or, or lines together. So um, I didn't meet Chris Barnes until Edge of Time, the game that came after that, where we did actually record in studio together. Still to the this day have not met Neil Patrick Harris, but Dan Gilvezan is a buddy of mine because we have the same voiceover agent. So before we all had our own studios at home, like the day at the office was like going into my voiceover agent's office and getting the scripts for those days auditions and waiting in line and reading in the booth. And so I would see him pretty much every day in the waiting room and we would chat and we would talk. And then once I got the role, like we were friends before I got the role as Spider-Man in the show. And then once I got the role and we kind of shared that in common, like we were just like talking about that kind of stuff. So it was, it was great to, uh, to be a part of that with him. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for your question. Anytime. Uh, nice to see you again. And Good to uh, see you, too. You'll always be my favorite Spider-Man, no matter Thank what. you so much. Awesome. All right. Well, last two questions. Hi. Name and question. Hello. My name's Megan. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had any fun stories or interactions from when you recorded for Hercules. For Hercules? Um, well, I, I have an embarrassing story. Um, <laughs> basically, I was like... 14 or 15 when we were actually doing the recording and um, you know he has his what was it like a like a donkey or um, a Penelope yeah, yeah. No, no, no. He has the, the, the horse Pegasus, but the, um, the the winged horse Pegasus. But then before, before he realizes he has his powers, um, before he goes up and meets Zeus, um, him and, and his uh, his father and mother have that. It's a, it's a donkey, right? Yeah, it's a donkey. Yeah, that named uh, Penelope. Well, when we were recording... I had never seen the name Penelope written on paper. I'd never seen it. Just, I'd never seen it. So I, uh, I had to read this scene and we were acting it out. And um, with all the confidence of a 15 year old, I was just like, come on, Penelope. <laughs> and silence, like they didn't read the next line. And there was just silence in the booth, and I was like waiting. I was like, what's going on? What's going on? And then they came over the talk back, and they're like, it's Penelope. And I'd heard the name Penelope before. I'd just never seen it in writing. And like, I turned beet red. And in my head, I was like, of course it's Penelope. Of course it's Penelope. <laughs> it was the most embarrassing thing. I'm like, how could you? Penelope? What? Like, it instantly made sense to me. And I was now in my head going, what were you thinking? Like, you couldn't. You you read for a living and and you, you like <laughs> that's hilarious. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> it was so embarrassing. But they all laughed about it. I end up I laugh about it now. But um, back then, yeah, it was that was that was probably one of the most embarrassing things that's happened to me in uh, in voiceover. That's I mean, so I funny. loved your performance in Hercules, regardless of the name. This time. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. thank you. And then we have our final question. Hi, what's your name and what's your question? Hello, Hi. my name is Marilyn, and Hi. my question for you is, you know, I just had it, but I just forgot it. Wow. <laughs> Oh, no. Um, my question for you... Oh, I remember. My question for you is, before you audition or before you go in the booth, what is, like, your mindset or what you, What are things that you do to be able to play the character efficiently? Um, that's a great question. I I get a good night's sleep. You have to rest because you, you need to have all your faculties. Um, I like to actually... I like to do two things. One, I like to do some sort of like calisthenic exercise just to get like blood flowing, whether that be jumping jacks, whether that be push-ups, something to just kind of, to, to clear your head of its thoughts, to force your body to not have any tension because you know, you're moving it. Um, stretch, I do a lot of stretching. Um, and then I kind of put, I, depending on the character, I'll physically put myself in a certain place. So for Shiro, I did push-ups because I needed to change my posture and I had to change the way I stood so that it could change the, the tone of voice that I spoke with. And it could all, it changes your demeanor. It, it kind of, the, the, I approached everything from like an on-camera place because that's where I started. And movement is really important. And whether or not they're seeing you, whether or not they're just hearing your voice, 
the movement and the physicality that you impart to the performance is going to translate in your voice. Mm. It's going to be it's going to be heard. So like a lot of it is just adopting physical characteristics, physical posture, um, to to get you to whatever character you need to be. So I I would I would approach it like it was an on camera character, like I was performing an on camera role, and I would do the same type of movements that I would do would I be performing that on camera. Wow. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for your amazing questions. Thank you all for being here. This time actually flew by, and I wasn't sure how it was going to be because I know it was like the last panel of the day. And so, no, yeah. No, this has been amazing. Con, this actually. has been yeah. spectacular. This has been spectacular. And um, I know you'll be at your table for at least whatever's left of this day. Yeah, I mean, I have, to, I have to catch a flight soon, but I'll be there probably for another hour. All right, so if you want to get down, ask any more questions, get something signed, go and see Josh down at his table. But one more time, big round of applause for Josh Keaton, Thank everyone. you, everybody. Thank you, Iowa.